Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Rolling. Yo, what's up? What's up, fiends? What's up, Nemo? Hi. Chilling, chilling. You were stealing time from the fiends. I was ready to go ten minutes ago, twenty minutes ago, and you were writing <laughs> writing some blog post for some blog. Yeah, our blog, freedomfiends dot com slash blog, the Freedom Fiends blog. You're stealing time for one folder on a server for something on another folder on a server. <laughs> I am. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt I had to though, because I don't know. I know it's a tyranny today, but this this story just struck me today as pretty horrendous. So I felt I had to uh, put something out there, and now I have a blog. So I decided not to wait to podcast. And we have a blog. We have a. We blog. and some of the fiends have a blog. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But um, I get to post on it whenever I want. I'm not used to having something like that. I like that you're uh, you're you're doing well with it. I hope you don't blog fade. Yeah, yeah. I hope I don't either. I mean, we'll you're doing, see. You're doing I haven't five. pod faded yet, so hopefully I don't <laughs> blog fade either. Yeah, I don't know. For me, sometimes it's easier to talk than to write. But uh, I, I guess that's because I write for a living and have for ten years. It's kind of like you know, if I played tennis for a living, I wouldn't want to go play tennis for recreation on the weekend like you do. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you don't work. I get- you don't make a living playing tennis yet, but <laughs> no, I don't think I ever will. In fact, the other day when we were playing tennis, um, this guy, I guess we found out he was from Nigeria, but uh, this guy just comes up and starts talking to us, and he didn't have a racket or balls, and um, but was he, he a tennis he hustler? To play. Was he a tennis hustler? No, I wasn't a hustler. We didn't bet, but uh, he wanted to play, and he wanted to play me since I'm the one who knows more about tennis and is more experienced than uh, my wife and her brother, who were the other people there. And he just like demolished me. Like the guy couldn't miss a ball. Uh, every shot he he hit was like an inch over the the not the fence. What is it? I guess it's the net. Fence. The net. That's it. Just sailed like over the net by an inch and super fast and hard. And it was it was impossible for me to beat the guy. But uh, he was not a tennis hustler. But yeah, I'm not I'm not gonna be pro by any means anytime ever. Hang on a sec. Yeah. So uh, you there, Nima? Yeah, I'm here. We had to do a little reboot, a little tweaking. Uh, you know, we're we're one of the better podcasts for a lot of reasons, and one is because when we hear a problem, we don't go, ah, oh, frigate, let's keep going. You know, <laughs> we stop and do it, even though I've been burning the podcast for an hour and a half or eight hours now. I think you've been working on this blog post. Eight hours, really? Is that how long it took me? <laughs> Felt like it. I don't think it was eight hours. Uh, I mean, really, no, you, all you got to say is cop shoots guy practicing free speech. It's square and horrible. Yeah, yeah. I no, guess. that's not it. That's not it. This is this is important. I, wa- so, I wanted uh, to I wanted to look at what the mainstream press was saying and look at what the alternative media was saying because there's not a whole lot of info out there and see if I could sort of weigh those two together and give people um, sort of both sides of that. Even though the state media is obviously biased towards the state. Um, they're the only people the cops will actually talk to. 
um, I think it was Pete Ayer had a video, or it was one of the cop block guys had a video of himself trying to talk to the cops, and obviously they didn't tell him anything. They yeah. don't tell the, the mainstream press much either, but um, they are tell the mainstream press what, what they want to have them say. What you, they want the mainstream you, press to hear. You have exactly. actually uh, encountered a cop while open carrying. This guy, explain briefly who this guy is and what happened. Okay, yeah, I sure will. Uh, his name is uh, Jeffrey Winehouse. And there's a post and on the Freedom Fiends blog, which you can access by clicking on the picture of the kitty with the computer over on the right of Freedom Fiends. Yeah, yeah, I did do a, a blog post on it. Um, guy's name was Jeffrey, I'm guessing it's spelled Winehouse or Weinhaus. It's W-E-I-N-H-A-U-S. I've never been good at pronouncing heavily Germanic names. If that is a Germanic name, I don't know. Um, but he is a member of uh, Central Missouri Cop Block. He'd been very vocal against uh, you know, police in the state for a long, long time. Um, the local paper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, um, had always labeled him like a gadfly. And they they've all, ha have a history of, of writing articles about him, trying to make him out to be a kook uh, and kind of a nutcase. Um and he's, an, he's an older guy too. He's not, you know, yeah, a young yeah. a young punk like uh, you and Pete Air. This guy looks about fifty fifty five. But he, he is full of machismo, libertarian flash. I don't um, know if that's a, an accurate term for this. I mean, that's when we say stuff like "f the poor, man." You know, uh, okay, th this is different. Maybe not, but he he's, he, he's full of he's full of spit and vinegar and uh, willing to stand up and say stuff and do stuff. Okay. Okay. There you go. Um, at any rate, Macho Flash is, is is talk usually. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what I mean when I say that, I mean he wouldn't pull punches. He, he he'd tell he'd call him like he sees him. You know, he he'd say exactly what was on his mind. Um, he didn't seem to try to sugarcoat things. Um, and obviously, this appears to have made him some enemies. Um, the St. Louis Post Dispatch was fond of saying he has many enemies in the area, and they even cited that as, as maybe a reason he's he's moved to a different area because he's pissed everybody off. He has many many enemies in the area because that paper has been making enemies for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was his own publisher. He published his own newsletter. Uh, he had his own website. Um, and he also was fond of doing YouTube videos. Apparently, the cops... Um, stole his computers uh came to his house i think uh last month and and just took his equipment his computers and his youtube video he says they took a, a good camera of his so he was using a cheaper camera or a friend's camera um basically looted the guy didn't really give a reason for it um i guess it was sort of one of those public asset seizures they're fond of doing um they say, at least, the they told the, the mainstream press that they had a warrant for his arrest. But um, I'm unsure if, if this Jeffrey Winehouse guy knew that he had a warrant out for him. Um, his friend on Cop Block, Cop Block reports that his friend said uh, there was no warrant, although the news says there was a warrant, so meh. So it seems like, at least on his end, there was maybe some unsureness about what the cops were doing. But uh, the cops... And him did work out a deal. They they arranged to meet. At least that's how the press states it. And uh, the his friend on Cop Block also states that you know they had they had decided to do this. They they were going to go meet. So they met up at a gas station. Uh, the guy was open carrying. Apparently, I don't know if it was open, if it was concealed, but he had a weapon on him. That doesn't seem to be in dispute. And the cops say that um, he pulled the gun on them. The TV news didn't have that. They just got the normal boilerplate stuff. Uh, there was a confrontation, shots fired. But uh, the paper says that um, a sergeant reported that he did pull the gun. Sergeant Al Notham said that Winehouse reached for his gun, and then officers, quote-unquote, in fear for their lives, fired at him, uh, hitting him at least twice. So he goes to meet the cops, and the cops shoot him. He's not dead. He's in critical condition, so please keep him in your, in your thoughts and prayers. Never talk to police. That that was kind of my initial feeling was, you know, why would you do that? Why would you go meet with the police? And if you're going to do it, maybe meet them. I, I you 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 said you know maybe at a police station, but I don't even know if I'd do that because obviously well, I mean, throw you, in the you know, but. if if the cops took my gun, took took my computers, and I was trying to get them back, I'd be working through an attorney. You know, so the meeting would right. take place probably in an attorney's office. Right. Right. Um, this guy, I don't know if he was 
very fond of attorneys. He had said some pretty mean things about lawyers uh, in some of his previous posts. And um, he, he was fond of filing lawsuits himself, at least on his website. Uh, if you view, view the second to last post, it's uh, a brief that I think he was sending to this, the state Supreme Court, uh, basically calling the state ridiculous and uh, calling them out for their crimes against him and uh, society in general. So I don't know if he was very fond of getting lawyers and working that way. Was he a sovereign citizen? Um, nobody seems to have called him that. So I'm not. Far. I'm not trying to paint him as that. No, I just I, know that a lot of people who uh, use that moniker or use those techniques end up getting targeted more heavily by the cops, which is I, ironic because the whole point of sovereign citizenship is allegedly being able to declare that right. you're off bounds to the cops. But right, he he didn't seem to be associated in any official way with I, I and i don't know if there is an official way to be associated with the sovereign <laughs> citizens movement well but, there's people um, who sell books saying there are <laughs> right well he, he didn't out, come out right and say that um although uh i think the newspaper had mentioned that he um oh, well he, he made one of those statements about how we're in some kind of maritime uh, state, Ugh. maritime or wartime state of, of being. So he used some of the language, it seems, that uh, sovereign citizens sometimes tend to use. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, defending the police and I'm not putting no, him down. I'm just saying um, that stuff doesn't always – that stuff doesn't seem to help <laughs> in dealing with the government. It seems to make them hate you more. Right, right. Um, yeah, he <laughs> he didn't seem to care too much if the government hated him or not. He said uh, he said yeah. quite a few um, things to the government. Um, see, he said some things that could possibly be construed as threatening. the The mainstream press seems to think they're more threatening than they actually seem. For instance, um, he did say that uh, at least. The, the newspaper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported that he said something to the effect of, um, you know, they've they've blocked me in every way. Now the only recourse I could have is is to shoot them. But I, I Jesus said that that's not the answer. I will not do anything like that. So he basically made a disclaimer, but he did mention, you know, violence, um, although he, di he soundly dismissed it as something he wasn't going to do. Hmm. But, um, you know, I don't think the cops took too kindly to that. I don't think the local officials took too kindly to that. And I'm wondering if if even up the chain, some other people were keeping an eye on him after. I mean, I'm bringing like I'm bringing this stuff up because and, and it'll probably piss off some of our listeners. Um, I think it's horrible what happened to him. I don't think the cops had a right to do it from what I can see or what's been reported. Uh you know, I, I'm imagining they they may the cops may have made up that he pulled his gun. Maybe he probably didn't. Maybe didn't. You know. Um, yeah, I kind of felt that way because you know, really, if you pull your your gun first, um, how are you not going to get a shot off? And and the the cops were specific in saying, or not, I guess it's not specific, but um, the cops were quoted as saying it's not known, or the paper reported that the cops did not report if Winehouse fired a shot. Um, yeah. and if they're trying to build a case for them doing this as a self-defense of officers kind of thing, I feel like they would have rolled that out by now. Yeah. If I just, actually um, did get a shot off. You know, I'm sure that uh, some people will say, you know, some people from followers of a certain, from Mark Stevens' podcast, those kind of people, they'll probably say that I'm, uh, I'm being the man. I'm being, you know, the COINTELPRO agent here by even questioning any of this. I just, uh, I personally don't use any kind of language like that uh sovereign citizen kind of tactics or i don't even want to call it that but just um you know pretending or or stating that the government has no pull over us because i know they do i know they can shoot you and get a medal for it um i also right. We're more fond of putting out that the pull they have on us is illegitimate and must cease at some yeah, point yeah um, it's immoral but and, we don't doubt that it exists and laughing at it although it's kind of hard to laugh in this situation uh also yeah, this isn't really a laughing one yeah you know we we don't talk to police i guess cop blocking by nature involves talking to police though it can yeah um yeah and i we don't make we don't make any threats veiled or otherwise you know, I think that's uh, 
I think that's a good way to get yourself in a lot of trouble. I right. mean, really, I think, you know, the people who would actually do something are the people who never speak of it and just do it. Although right. there are exceptions to that. You know, I mean, there are people who have committed political murders or whatever who've, uh, you know, chattered about it on, on the Internet or to people ahead of time. But I, I guess what I'm saying is the ones they should be afraid of are the ones who don't talk about it, which is, you know, why they want to bug all our thoughts and homes and prayers. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't really want to play Monday morning quarterback or, or anything like that. Uh, and we don't really know a whole lot of details. Yeah. I, I, I really hope, I mean, for the obvious reasons, you know, that he, that he lives and that he pulls through, you know, just because he's a human being and it's ridiculous that, that he has to go through this. But I also really think that that's one of the only ways we'll ever know uh, or get closer as close as we can to the truth about what happened is is to hear him tell what happened and i know it'll be still it'll still be his side of the events but um i don't think you get anything close to a reality out of out of what the state will get with their investigation in this why i wonder why someone wasn't videotaping i mean i would think that that was my other thing i said know. it didn't want to be monday morning quarterback but um you know and this this it seemed like it was more of a personal thing for him than a cop block kind of action. You know, you say, yeah. well, if you're a cop yeah. blocker, you confront people. I don't know if that's what he was going for here because I feel like if it was, um, and at, in either case, I feel like he, he maybe should have used the buddy system here. I mean, I don't like to, I don't know what he did and what actually happened, but I feel like if it were me, I would definitely make sure I had somebody with me, maybe two or three people, cameras on the whole time. I mean, you know, that's a, I, um, I go back to AA a lot for advice on things. Uh, in AA, when you do a 12 step call, which is coming to someone who's still, you know, in the addiction and trying to minister to them, I guess it's usually done when the person asks for it, but sometimes it's done like if their wife asks for it, you know, you'll go talk to them. Um, it's always done in pairs. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple yeah. reasons for that. One is because, you know, you're probably going into a place where there are drugs and alcohol and you don't want to be tempted. So you bring someone with you. But, you know, another is like the person could attack you and you want someone else there to, Mm -hmm. to uh to protect you and i guess in this case the protection would be um and i don't want to play monday morning quarterback i don't want to say he should have done this he should have done that but maybe in the future you know if someone does go to talk to the cops maybe someone else comes with a camera yeah yeah i think that's always a, a good and helpful strategy um i i guess general. it's i guess it's i feel weird analyzing this to the point of like you know what could have been done differently especially when there's so little confirmed information but um right you know i think it's important for people to look at different sides of things uh everything i'm seeing on this is just here's what happened it's horrible you know and it is horrible but uh i want to know more and i want to know what could prevent yeah. this in the future yeah yeah i do too um you know, I, I think the mainstream press will come out with some more reports, obviously, this evening. Uh, the reporter at, I think, WMOV said that this was the story he was working on today. He's going to hopefully come through with a, a full package at 6. I don't know. I, in my experience, the cops really don't give you any more information on this. I, I did an officer-involved shooting last summer when I was in Washington. And, you <laughs> and um I guess that's using the state speak to, that, to call it an officer involved shooting. But I did a story where cops shot a guy uh, last summer and, you know, they trotted out their public information officer, which is their PIO uh, on these kind of things. He's the only one who will ever talk. And he hated his job. Like after this incident, the PIO actually quit because it was a new guy. He was like, I hate doing this. I'm not going to do it. Anymore. <laughs> um, but they trot their PIO out. They'll only give you, um, you know, these these boilerplate statements like there was a. Um, there was a confrontation. Shots were fired. I, I think that's what they're trained to say. I'm pretty sure they go to like a PIO school or PIO well, training. Well, in and and in that video where uh, Pete was calling asking for ma information, he got shuffled through, through a couple different people who all were like, uh, "You have to talk to the public information people. We have nothing to say about this. We don't know. We don't know anything." Right, right. And at, at first glance, somebody who's not experienced with it will say, "Oh man, I can't believe it. It's just because of this. The cops are are you know they must really have something to hide." But that's how cops that's, act. That's how cops. I mean, that's time, how I would act. Day, day. That's how yeah. I would act. You know, if uh, if I shot somebody in self defense uh, and the Prairie Pravda called me for a statement, which I'm sure they would. Um, you know, I'd be like, I have nothing to say. Talk to my attorney, and my yeah. attorney would probably yeah. say nothing either. 
Well, if, if you call the main number and ask them any question, you know, how many DUIs were there last night? Uh, stuff that makes them, that they think makes them look good. Uh, they'll still shuffle you to a PIO. Yeah. Because that, that's the PIO's job. And, and it's a liability, liability thing that the, the state goons want to cover their ass. So they, they appoint one person who's good at PR to do all the PR. That way he takes the fall if there's any, any big screw And they up. can fire him and get somebody else. Yeah. They can fire him, get somebody else. Yeah. Um, now, when I was in uh, covering the officer-involved shooting uh, last summer in, in Washington, um, you know, they trotted their guy out. He basically told us nothing, uh, made us wait, and he he had a habit of of not releasing information until four o'clock. He'd tell you all day, all day. Yeah, I'm going to be releasing this today, so that you're working on it, you're committed <laughs> to the story, and then and then he'd release it an hour before deadline. That sounds um, planned to me. That sounds planned to get what they want on the news it is it is and i i think that this is um it's a good strategy on the cops behalf and and i could definitely see something like that happening in this case um you know it, it was it was so consistent and it even happened when they when they came out with their final report because supposedly they they do this independent investigation which really isn't independent um where i was at it was it was actually the the neighboring towns police department and a state uh and state officials would come in and investigate it. But they're still part of the state. I mean, they're still buddy-buddy. They eat donuts together, that kind of thing. It doesn't really feel independent to me. When they when they actually released their results, um, you know, they did it uh, three at 3 o'clock. Uh, deadline is obviously 5 o'clock. They told us to be there at 3. They waited till like 3.30 for everybody to show up. So And, and then they give you this 50-page report. Uh, you don't have time to look for it through it you know because as soon as they give it to you there's there's they're talking and you have to record them you got to get that sound bite because your competitor is going to get the sound bite and you have to have your camera on and you're looking through it and you try to ask questions and they don't really answer them uh specifically they, they talk in their vagaries and they stick to their points so that way when you go to air all you really have to go on is is the talking points they wanted to be heard by the public word so i, I feel like on, on something like this if because cop block seems to be taking some kind of ownership of it. I feel like um, what would really be helpful is if somebody tries to get, uh, you know, if there was a security camera maybe at the, the gas station because they did apparently meet at a gas station. I don't know if the cops were aware already of that. Took it. They probably already took it. Already took it or maybe parked out out. The, the purview of it. I mean, cops obviously work closely with these kinds of things. Maybe they knew uh, what the actual view of the gas station's cameras were. Maybe it was one they worked with. And, you know, an interesting thing with uh, inequities in uh, access is, okay, if the cops went to that gas station, you know, five hours after this and said, we need the security footage, the guy they'd hand it, it over. Yeah, okay? completely. If someone from mm -hmm. Cop Block or some unaffiliated citizen or possibly even the news went and asked the same question, they'd be like, uh, I got to talk to somebody first, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the cops would probably get it first, and um, even if they didn't, I, I could imagine a situation where the gas station clerk uh, says, you know, you got to talk to the cops about that. I, I, I planned on giving that to the cops, so the cops already got dibs on it. Um, you know, go through them. Or if it's if it's owned by a corporation, you don't even get that far. You know, they'll say, oh, well, you got to call call up the corporate ladder. But the cops it, probably could just ask, you know, could probably just talk to the clerk and get it, too. They could probably just lean on the clerk and get it, too. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, they're cops. You know, like, don't I remember you? Didn't you get arrested for weed one time? You shouldn't be working here. You know, I'm not right. saying these cops do that in this situation but cops do that kind of stuff and can do that kind of stuff all the time right and i'm glad you brought up uh the drug war angle too because that was supposedly the warrant um that uh that the cops or the, the highway patrol had for winehouse um they and had you know if, if the place sells liquor too they could they could threaten and say oh i could call my buddy at ab you know alcohol control and uh have him come yep. in here and check things out and see if you're on the level you yeah, know, they can they, threaten over the monopoly of uh, of of licensing. Exactly, they've they've got tons of ways to pressure you, and and one of those ways is is how they were pressuring Winehouse too. They had um, uh, God, what was the warrant? Uh, oh, here it goes. Um, two counts of possession of a controlled substance and one count of tampering with a judicial officer. What was so, the controlled substance? Um. The St. Louis Post Dispatch did not say. Um, this guy I'm does not, not look either. like a drug user, although who knows? And he you know, he well, looks like Lou Rockwell. <laughs> uh, several years ago, um, he was 
infamous around the area for throwing raves. Um, and really, so, this guy. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, that guy. <laughs> so apparently he used to be a party animal. Dude, apparently, he looks like my high, my grade school principal. I can't picture my grade school principal throwing raves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he doesn't really look the part. Um, I'm not saying that that means obviously he could have a count of drug possession. I, I just mean, um, you know, the cops had some sort of sense that there would be some dirt they could get on this guy. Well, you so know, I don't know with if raves up too. the controlled substance charge or, or what they were doing. With but. raves, too, they often uh, uh, arrest the people putting them on for whatever is happening there, alleged or otherwise, whether the people putting it on had anything to do with it. Right, right. Well, a- according to the paper, um, his neighbors didn't like the raves, so they, they petitioned <laughs> the state to, to put a stop to them. Um, basically, I, I'm not sure if it was a, a, a civil suit or what it was, but the judge ordered him to not have any more raves, um, and he threw another rave so he could pay his legal fees, <laughs> which I thought was <laughs> awesome. kind of funny. Which uh, is like raves, and that's why people usually hold raves out in the wilderness, you know, or out in the sticks. Uh, well, he was out in the sticks. He had like a big chunk of land, oh, but I guess he had, he, had some other, he had some other rural neighbors too that – I don't know if they just didn't like people having fun or if it was particularly noisy or, or what. Probably both. Yeah, probably a little bit of both. Um, but at any rate, um, yeah, uh, whatever happened, the consequences are, are pretty horrible. I mean, this guy is in critical condition in the hospital, and I just wanted people's hearts and prayers to be with him. And I also wanted to let people know about this Um just because it feels very real, you know. This this guy basically made a living, um, how you and I hope to make a living with with people, you know, paying us uh, to put their advertisements on our content because we have so many readers. He had he had a very uh, thriving local following. People loved to read him, um, and basically his shtick was oh, and was he likes dogs. Status. I'm looking at one of his videos. He's got his pretty dog sitting on yep. his lap. Yeah, I almost uh, put a different picture of him with his dogs. It looked really cute and it really humanized him. But uh, he was shirtless and I kind of thought uh, twice about it. I was like, if I was laid up in the hospital, I wouldn't want uh, a picture of me shirtless being passed around the internet. <laughs> um, but you can if, – if if that doesn't bug you, 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 um, you, know, you can go to his Facebook page. It's still up. Uh, leave your thoughts and wishes with him. And um, some of his family has a thread going on there where they're giving a, a little, a few updates here and there. Um, apparently, he does have a few kids. I don't know how many, but um, even his uh, his ex must have been two times removed uh, was was following this and sort of being the I don't know if his first wife or what but she was sort of being the ringleader on on getting the information out there and telling everybody to uh, to keep their their heart with with Jeff worms hi I'm Michael Dean from the freedom fiends and like you I'm concerned with privacy on the internet the electronic police state is strangling our previous protections and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B-O-L-E-H-V-P-N dot net. Ugh, I'm so sick of looking at Steve's wedding pics, and I'm all out of passive-aggressive comments. What else am I supposed to do at work all day? Sick of stalking your ex on Facebook? Yeah! Are you all out of cute cats and autocorrect mishaps to lol at? Duh! Freedom Fiends to the rescue! The Fiends now have a blog. Read all about the latest tyranny today. Dream about lip pair. Laugh while Western civilization collapses. Just click on the cat icon to the right of freedomfiends.com. Freedom Fiends blog. Read it! So, Nemo. What's up? I've lost 10 pounds eating lots of yummy food. Really? How long has it been? Like three or four weeks. Wow. Man, yeah. that's quick. Yeah, good I job. guess I'm going to have to do a blog post of our diet when I lose about 10 more. You are. I hope you took before pictures, too. 
Uh, I have before pictures. <laughs> I don't know if I want before pictures, but yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, congratulations. I'm I'm jealous. Yeah, it's a very modified paleo. It's a, so modified, I don't even know if you can call it a paleo, but I'm not eating a lot of a lot of the things that paleos don't eat. Okay. So, but you know, you're basically. It sounds like you're basically just avoiding grains, right? Uh, a little more than that, but okay. avoiding grains, avoiding dairy, um, avoiding sugar, processed sugar. Yeah. Um, eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of meat. Um, you know, we're doing a little what I would call cheating, and I I've heard you shouldn't use the word cheating too. It's like free food, you call it, which is a free meal. <laughs> uh, which is which is a meal that doesn't fit your plan, you know. Yeah. Um. I I'll, I'll code if I'll write it down when I get when I have more faith in it, you know, when I've lost okay. a significant okay. amount. I mean, ten okay. pounds is a lot. I weighed like one eighty one, and I weigh one. No, I weighed one eighty nine, and I weigh one seventy nine now. So nice, nice. Yeah. I, I I've been trying to do something like that, but it's. Damn near impossible. This um, isn't damn near impossible, though. I mean, you well, know, it, you it end up when your wife's a when your wife's a vegetarian, it's a lot harder. Cause I'll, I'll when when I cook for myself, right? Uh, you know, I'll cook bacon and eggs in the morning. I'll avoid grains all day. Not a big deal. But then my wife spends hours baking homemade bread and making a fancy pasta that she's so excited about, and I can't be like, "Fuck that!" Yeah. So well, me and I DJ are and me and DJ get... are both doing the diet too, which makes it a lot easier. You know, it's yeah. kind of like when when two couples are heroin addicts and only one of them tries to get clean, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> right. You know, right? Right. That's been my well, experience. Well, well, they say wheat uh, wheat is an addiction. And um, wheat I, is, you know, we and corn. Corn is like, yeah. People can't digest it, man. Corn is what we feed the birds. Corn is uh, what we feed the squirrels. Corn yeah, is it's in, it's in everything. It's corn. I know. Corn is basically packing material. You know, uh, it's yeah, a building yeah. material. I call it. But literally, pretty much, I forget the number. But um, Michael Pollan in his book, um, what's it called Omnivore's Dilemma, he's got a thing about uh, corn and. We eat modern Americans probably eat more corn than any any other society in history. Yeah, and it's really know, it's really tied in with government subsidies too. I mean, the entire is. state of Iowa has been like taken over by corn. Like they don't even do hay there anymore. C corn and soybeans, yeah, all year long. Like the whole state is covered by it. Which is, you know, I don't have a uh, a lot of libertarians are doing the paleo diet, and part of the reason is like. Uh, to avoid government intervention or whatever. Um, I guess so, but food is such a basic thing. It's really hard for me to do that. That's not any, that's not very much of my motive at all. It's, it's health and weight. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, I mean really like even what we're eating that doesn't have all this other stuff, there's, there's very little we eat that probably doesn't have some Monsanto product used in, used in creating it. Yeah. You know, we're not eating uh straight from the farmer's market. We're still eating from Walmart, but just eating right. better and not ordering pizzas and not ordering Chinese takeout food. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, I mean, 10 pounds in a few weeks, that's pretty awesome. It it's is. It's hard to argue with that. Ho hopefully it stays consistent. And I, I'm proud well, of you. Well, what I've talked to a lot of people, it won't stay that consistent. Um, yeah. That's a lot of water weight loss too. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Although I don't feel dehydrated or anything, but I look better. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Are you still drinking the diet sodas or? Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. something you don't do on paleo. Yeah. Yeah. Although we're drinking, I'm drinking, she's drinking a lot less. Of them. I'm drinking less and drinking more fruit drinks, you know, that don't have added fructose, just real fruit drinks. Um, yeah. Lemonade made with uh, stevia, which is a. Okay. Uh, a, pla a leaf ex extract. Yeah. It's a sweetener. Mm -hmm. and, we have uh, plenty of that now. So. A lot more water, a lot less milk. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I drink a lot of water, but then I feel bad, like I'm getting too much uh, fluoride. <laughs> so I try not to drink too much tap water. We're actually fond of buying um, club soda, just sparkling water. Uh, I feel like it really keeps me from drinking sugary sodas or diet sodas because uh, it's the carbonation. It's that burn in my throat that I really crave. Like, <laughs> I, I, I can do without the sweetness. I'm, I don't have a sweet tooth. I'm not a big sugary kind of guy. So I'm fine with just getting the, the sparkling water and drinking that. Um, and as far as flavors go, my wife actually did take to my mom's recipe that she gave out on the last uh, live show or the live show before that, I guess. Uh, the cucumber, mint, and lemon water. 
Uh, yeah. Just cut, cut a bunch of those up and throw it in a pitcher with water, and it, it really does absorb the flavor. It tastes delicious. Nice. Yeah. So did you check out this band, Corporate Avenger? Corporate Avenger. We'll uh, we'll check them out during the break and come back and talk about them. Okay. Is that one of the, the band that the Fiend gave yeah. us? It said it was kind of like Rage Against the Machine, but uh, yeah. not John, statist. Yeah, John sent it to us. And, okay. Uh, yeah, I did see that. It was on my... They're, they're really good, list. man. They're really they? good. They're, uh, they're all Native American. Oh, awesome. And uh, they're... I mean, I don't know if they're libertarian, but they're against a lot of the same things we are. They have songs okay. about taxes or theft, and they have songs about nice. police are horrible. And... Uh, yeah, and it's you know it's kind of like kind of sounds like Ministry, Skinny Puppy, uh, KMFDM, you know, kind of old school industrial. They've yeah. been together since '98, and they're still around, and they're really really good. Okay. I like them. Okay. You know, there's a band, there's a band that I I want. You ever heard of a band called Sin Daddy from Texas? No, Sin Daddy. It's similar oh. kind of music, and I know the guy, and I wanted to hook you up with him. I think he's in Houston or Dallas, but it might be someone you wanted to do some music with. Um, he does. Old school industrial kind of stuff with a lot of analog sequencers. Um, oh, nice. He used to do shows there, and it was pretty popular. I, I couldn't, I couldn't find him though. He seems to have disappeared. Like he's not on Facebook. Uh, he's not on Facebook. He doesn't exist. No, he's not on <laughs> Facebook. He's on MySpace, but he hasn't updated for like two years. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. If anyone knows Sin Daddy, hook us Sin up with Daddy. him for Nima. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll check that out. Um, so and I've also got um, um, another person I should be working with on the album, uh, another rapper and beat maker, anarchist, uh, who actually sought me out from hearing me on the Disindoctrination pro- podcast. So uh, k- kudos to Garrett Fox's audience on that one. Yeah, you have to give him a finder's fee of one tenth of your tenth of a bitcoin you have. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yep. Yeah. So um, so I woke up from really beautiful dreams last night. I don't know what I was dreaming. Some like, you know, sexual lib pair or something. Um, <laughs> and like woke up, turned on the computer and there's all this tyranny. And I'm like, ugh, it's that podcast day. I mean, I'm always excited for podcast today. Today, I kind of wanted to get it over with. Not Now I don't. Now I feel like, yeah, we're doing it. I want to do it. And I want to do a full length one. Um, but I was like, maybe we can cut it short. I'm not feeling good. This is horrible. And, you know, it's really... Uh, you know, people who don't see the tyranny of the state still kind of get overwhelmed by the news sometimes. Like, you know, yeah, you listen they- to that song, Ball of Confusion from the 60s. It's about, like, all the unrest in the world. And and when you compound on top of that, seeing that everything the state does is immoral, it can be crazy-making. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if yeah. crazy-making is the word, but it's like I woke up from this glorious dream, turned on my computer, and, like, had to go to work, and, oh, my God, things are horrible today. I mean... Ugh. Well, when you're anarchist, even the the news positioned as good news on mainstream TV sites <laughs> is know. bad news because it's know. always like this new law got passed or <laughs> or look look at all the extra funding this this group got from the government. Yay! It's like ugh, that's yeah. horrible, you guys. That's not good news. And a new law that passed that I want to touch on just briefly is uh, even though it's huge, is that the ATF can now yes has, has passed a policy that they can seize guns. In drug cases, and it sounds like even if the person is not charged or is yeah. found innocent, they can do it uh, just like they do with uh, you know cash right now and and other things to where they can basically just say, well, this is a drug investigation, so we're going to seize this up front. Uh, your guns now, not not just other property. Your, so your square, guns, man. they can so take square. them away from you. Yeah, yeah, completely ridiculous. And this is um, Department of Justice basically giving the marching orders <laughs> for the ATF of all people. The so, ironically it, named Department of Justice. Exactly, exactly. And um, <laughs> that that I becomes that becomes uh, Orwellian speak in, yeah. in a case oh, like yeah. this. The Department mm-hmm. of Justice will steal your property. Yeah, yeah. Well, just like the Department of Defense is actually the Department of Offense. Uh, you know, they used to be a little bit more honest about it. It used to be called the Department of War, but now it's the Department of Quote Unquote. I know. Defense. When did they change that? 60s, 50s? 50s or 60s, I think. I'm not 100% sure. It was yeah. after World War II, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, moving right along from that. Um, really? I to, you don't have anything else? I, I, was no. that the tyranny you woke up and saw and was like, Wah. Yeah, I've already thrown up in my heart, and uh, I want to move on. <laughs> okay. I mean, we can, we can. Well, I'll link it. You know, link I really, I go. don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the tyranny today. We spent a quarter of the episode talking about, yeah, uh, the cop locker that got shot because you know we're 
tacitly connected with that organization by friends. And yeah, and it's yeah. a really shocking thing. You know, it's not just some guy. It's some guy that knows people we know, right. um, which definitely we talked about it for a reason. And I, I don't think we talked about it too long. But, um, you know, I really want to get away from the tyranny today. Yeah, yeah. I want to escape it. I'd rather talk about how it's harming me than talk about specific examples and yeah. talk about how we cannot be harmed by it. And, yeah. you know, dump that stuff on the blog, dump that stuff on the Sunday show. Um, I think that's the plan, isn't it? That's the plan. Yeah, yeah. So I want to, I want to call I just, this. I, I did. I did feel assaulted by it today, <laughs> though, and I think you did too. Yeah. That's why I wanted to mention what I mentioned at the beginning of the cast, and, and yeah. this one was the other one I had on my radar. Yep. Um, I mean, I even sent that ATF one to somebody I know who works for a lawyer. You know that I would never bother with typical tyranny today is at work, but like your boss may need to know about this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, this may come up. Yeah. Um. So I want to call this episode, I am no longer an artist. I use the tools of art for propaganda. <laughs> well, see, I think you and me disagree on that because I, I still think you're you're an artist, even if you use art for propaganda because you're still creating it. Um, well, I guess I think, the... I think I, artists art no matter the motive behind the creation. I guess that could be argued, but I guess um, what I'm saying, and I got in a big argument with, with an artist who's a fan of ours on Facebook about this. Um... I guess what I'm saying is that considering myself an artist or making pure art is no longer important to me. And I have those tools that I've spent a lifetime gathering and perfecting. And now I only want to use them to, to say things. Okay. Okay. Hey, I think that's great. I, I think you're still a type of artist, but I think you can be more specific and call yourself a propagandist or uh, an activist, uh, an, an arctivist. No, I yeah. can't really do that. Something <laughs> well, I, like that. I guess I'm an artist in the same sense that, you know, a graphic designer who's really good with uh, drawing and Photoshop and, and illustrator who works for an ad agency is still an artist. You know, if you ask yeah, them what they do for a living, they're not going to say an artist. They're going to say, I work for an ad agency or I'm a graphic designer for an ad agency. And those people may do art on the side for the sake of art. They may, you know, paint a beautiful picture and hang it up in their living room. Um I don't have to hang that picture up in my living room anymore is what I'm saying. Like I do not have any, I mean, I, for 10 years, I defined myself as an artist and I wrote books about how to be an artist and use yeah. the word artist. Like it was some pure, uh, thing to attain that made you better than people who are only interested in commerce or propaganda or whatever. Um, I no longer have that. Like I used to have this picture hanging up on my wall. It was something, um, it was in Texas. It was a picture. It was someone had made this. I don't know if they'd altered a stop sign or made their own stop sign or what, but it said like, uh, it was a stop sign, but it said art allows me to exist. And I hung that up on my wall for a decade because it was that important to me. And now I'm yeah. like, F that man. Art <laughs> allows me to, to, you know, rail at the world and point out the inequity. And, uh, more than that too, just art allows me to, I guess all art has a purpose, you know, all art. Yeah. Someone said all art is propaganda, which I don't really agree with. But, um, you know, I mean, a lot of the great art through the ages was religious art. Um, you know, Bruegel was religious art. A lot yeah. of art was done for the king, you know, at the king's beck and call. Or if you did something that was against the king, you'd end up in stockades. It looks like we're headed back there with that news this morning. You know, they'll shoot you. Um, and... I think that even art that doesn't say anything, I've said this before, I think it has one message and it's me, you know, me and with an exclamation point, like I made this kind of thing, but yeah. I don't have any need for that anymore. Oh, you don't. Okay. See, I, for me, there, there's still one in the same. I still feel like when I create art, it is to, um, to give a message, but I feel like that doesn't make it any less art. I feel like, um, even when I did my, the, the stories in Wyoming that I actually liked and didn't feel dirty about doing uh, when I was a reporter, I felt like those were a form of art. Um, and for me, the art I've consumed has always been um, trying to tell a message through the use of, you know, uh, language uh, or music, you know, protest music or, or reading 1984. I was all, that was always the kind of art that spoke to me um, or fight clubs. It's something that made you feel 
uh, viscerally that something is wrong in the world and hinted <laughs> at maybe what it was. DJ ordered new t-shirts for us recently. She likes to get t-shirts, which I, I dig having good t-shirts. And she got one for me that said Paper Street Soap Company nice. with, the, with the logo. And the other one said Inatech with the logo. Okay. Do you know, do you know what Inatech? <laughs> off, it's off, the company in Office, office space. space. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm a, I'm a Mike Judge fan. Yeah. yeah. I definitely know that. Yep. Yep, and, uh, yep. But I guess yeah, the argument I got on, on Facebook with some artist fan of ours was about, uh, you know, she was disagreeing with me on the same things you're disagreeing, but she was also disagreeing with my use of the word propaganda. And she looked it up on the dictionary and posted the, the definition of it. It basically said something intended to lie. And, hmm. uh, you know, it had a, a secondary explain or definition of something intended only to persuade but you know the fact that the dictionary put lie first you know i said i mean if you looked up anarchist in that same dictionary it'd probably say someone who destroys things and wants chaos you know i think that words are fluid and mm -hmm. she said you can't just yeah. say words are fluid you can't just make up your own meaning then you're no worse than this you're no better than the statists who you know use terms like uh like, but you're you know, not advocate. You're, you're not making up your own meaning. You're right. advocating for a meaning that you think is in, is existent in it. Right. Current language. And I would argue that words sh are well should be fluid, but even beyond that, are fluid. And like nothing can stop them from being fluid. Exactly. You know. Yeah. I mean, if if they passed a law in some county, you know, the kids couldn't say dope or worms. You know, if the kids were saying it, the kids would still say it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. If you, 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 you know, can't get rid of it. The if you pass a law that says English is the the official language of America, that's not going to stop other people from speaking it. And, you know, a good example is in Ireland, the official language legally is Gaelic. Only 3% of uh, Ireland can speak <laughs> Gaelic. 97% of them speak English only and can't even speak any Gaelic. You know, what do you think is the, the de facto official language of Ireland? It's English. You know, it's what Obviously. people speak. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you can't, you can't stop language from from changing and evolving over time. I mean, any any professional linguist will tell you as such. Any any kid who's taken a linguistics class in college will tell you as such. That's just a known fact that that you can't you can't socially plan or centrally plan the way an uh, a language will evolve. It, it's out of your hands. It's organic. It's it's anarchic order. Which is a, it's a good yeah, example. It's the it. free market. I mean, there's yeah. there's a saying: a dialect is uh, a language is a dialect with an army, which is <laughs> is kind of an ironic reinforcement of what this person was arguing with me of what of what the official uh, case is, not what the de, de facto case is. It's the right. de jure line, not the de facto line. Right. So yeah, I, I would I would disagree with her on. Uh, I mean, I think it, it it maybe it's not the the most accurate word to use propaganda because I feel like there is um, a search for the truth in your heart when when you make these kinds of things. I think I think you feel like you've found something that people need to know and you're trying to share it with them, which I think the propaganda does have a connotation of having sinister motives. Um, well, there's there's a term propaganda of the deed which was an anarchist term in the late 1800s for blowing things up to inspire other people to blow things up. So it's also tainted <laughs> in connection yeah. with anarchism in that sense. But that wasn't our kind of anarchism. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, it, it, it is a tainted term in a few ways, and I think maybe you like to use it for your machismo uh, Oh, it is definitely <laughs> macho, macho libertarian flash. Um, yeah, I mean... It's it's a really loaded word, and it's Which generally then again points to your being an artist that you would use such a term <laughs> like that. Ah, uh, busted. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, the term propaganda is a term that's generally used by propagandists as a slam term of people making propaganda that they don't like. Yeah. You know, yeah, Bill exactly. O'Reilly <laughs> uses the word propaganda for anybody who's putting out any information that he doesn't agree with on his, ironically. Right named spin show the, the no, no spin, spin zone, zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's the all spin zone man there's no yeah, facts yeah. in that show it's all spin it's the pro spin zone yeah that's uh that's that's orwellian yeah yeah it is um so yeah i still think you're a type of artist but if you want to call yourself a propagandist i'm i'm not going to stop you well, that's why I'm calling the episode, I'm no longer an artist, not we're no longer artists. <laughs> okay. I'm, this cast is named for my thoughts. Fair enough. 
So I got a correction from last week. My interview with Henry Rollins is in $30 Music School, not $30 Writing School. Okay. And, uh, you know, I watched some 9-11 porn yesterday, terror porn, 9-11 porn. I'm glad I was able to avoid that. I, I barely noticed that it was... The I didn't either until, like, and I, the evening. I'm thankful for that. Until the evening, and I wanted to watch some TV, and it's what was on. Um, I'm kind of interested in watching that every year as it comes out, because... It's interesting from a filmmaker point of view and a story point of view of how they keep coming up with new documentaries about it with new footage you haven't seen. But, you know, it's New York City. It's probably got more, you know, not just closed circuit cameras on the street per capita now than anywhere in the world. It's probably got more privately owned video cameras per block than anywhere in the world, except maybe yeah. Tokyo. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of footage of that. And an interesting thing in this that had no commentary, it was just... uh it just kind of went by. They were playing uh, 911 calls on 9-11 uh, of people calling from within the building. And some of the people within the building called and said, we're on the 100th floor. Um, you know, should we evacuate or, or what should we do? And the, the 911 operator said, you should stay where you are and wait for rescue. <laughs> that person killed those people by saying that. He did. And the people yeah. who didn't call 911, who just trusted their instincts, people on the 100th floor got out. You know, they walked down 100 floors through the smoke in, in the fire escape and they got out. Wow. Wow. And you could also blame, you know, public conditioning, public schools, horizontal enforcement uh, that prevented people from following their instincts, which yeah. are natural law, prevented people from following their natural gut instincts, their natural law uh, in favor of listening to the bureaucrat on the other end of the phone, the the 9-11 dispatcher, who basically, yeah, like you said, it has a role to play in their being, being killed. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing, too, was the the Marriott World Trade Center, which is um, three World Trade Center. And I'm not going to get into any like how it fall, fell, why it fell, who caused it to fall. I'm just talking about the people's reactions, which is now what, mm -hmm. the, what I'm looking for in this. Like a really interesting thing is in a lot of this, there's footage of a mass exodus of people out of that area on both sidewalks, you know, not in the street because yeah. there's emergency vehicles pulling in and people trying to get out. But on the sidewalks, there are people just trucking out of that area like oh, yeah. as soon as the planes hit the first building and some of them were from the first building and the second building but it's like i can't believe everyone didn't get out of the second building as soon as the first building they stayed a lot of them stayed in their office and looked out the window at it i'm proud of the i look at the people walking away from it and i'm proud of them i'm like that's what you should do man yes when get something the hell out insane of there. and chaotic and violent and explosive is happening in your neighborhood get out you know yep, yep, yep. and and there were people and, and the in, news likes to make fun of preppers but i bet if any preppers right. were in those buildings they got that <laughs> that, that was the, the s hitting the fan right there yeah they got well the hell out. there was actually some footage shot in someone's apartment that they showed too there were a lot of different sources in this and one was some people in an apartment watching it from about you know a mile away um deciding to get out of their house and just baffled at what to do they were like yeah let's see socks shoes you know i mean i have a bag of stuff packed i had a bag of stuff packed before i was into all this and lived in california because we lived in forest fire neighborhood you know mm -hmm. um but i know exactly what i'd grab if i had to get out quick i know what i'd grab if i had one minute to, to get out i know what i'd grab if i had five minutes to get out i know what i'd grab if i had an hour to get out right, you know right. um you know <laughs> the first thing would be uh pets first aid kit and guns you know yep. some handguns but uh yep. you know beyond that i have a bag packed with you know an overnight bag packed with some clothes in it for different weather so yeah i keep uh water and extra clothes in the trunk of my car at all times um Good. as well as tools and you should have a rifle stuff. in there um i don't because I, I like to keep my rifle next to you my you should bed. have another you should have an extra rifle in there a, i you should know, cheap cheapy rifle in there yeah buy it buy another mosin and and make it be my, my that's mosin's mosin. really common for trunk yeah. guns um yeah so the marriott hotel is like i don't know it looks about 15 stories tall it was 22 stories it was it's right under it was right under the two towers i mean it was mm -hmm. part of the same complex mm -hmm. they about a dozen people got out of there because they were in the one reinforced place when it collapsed when they were trying to get out well, yeah, hundreds of people sat in their hotel room 
watching Look, this and go up and, at the burning yeah, and, and going, well, I've got this deposition to give it an hour or two blocks up the street. I have to stay here and prepare for it. No, you yeah. get out, man. Yeah. Well, there's a building above you on fire that could collapse. You get out. Yes, yes. Go People until are, you're in the Hudson or, you know, in upstate New York. I mean, yeah. get clear out or of go New York City. Up, uptown at least, you know, get away from yeah. I mean, I would get away from something where there were a lot of police and firemen anyway, just to, first of all, because they tend to, you know, arrest people and shoot them for no reason in situations like that. I don't know if that, ha I don't think that happened there much, but, uh, you know, I mean, there was another cop block thing today of in New York City, um, guy fleeing armed robber was shot by police. I don't know if you saw that one, wow. but no, you know, another thing one. is like literally, okay, if there's, if there's any time when the monopoly on, you know, human safety has any effect in ever helping people, it's that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I, I don't, firemen tend to be in cahoots with the cops, but they do tend to stay up and like, to, to like show up and put out fires sometimes. So I would just get out of there to get out of their way, man. And because yeah. I know that play situations like that, you know, even not terrorist attacks, just fires or whatever, tend to turn into, uh, you know, freedom free zones pretty quickly. Right, right. Um, you know, me personally, uh, just because of who I am, I might stay at what I assumed was a safe distance yeah. to get footage or to document it in some way. Um, but I wouldn't advise yeah, anybody I'm, else to I'm do not, that. I'm not that committed to art or news gathering that I would want to stay and film it. And a lot of people did, too. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So uh, and we'll go sell some things. Okay. Sounds good. You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well-crafted blueprint to create an ever-increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing. Buttons! Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for guns and weed the road to freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to FreedomFiends.com and click on the link at the top that says Buttons. Want to contribute to Liberty but short on cash? You can help the Freedom Fiends without even spending a post-1964 dime. Download uTorrent and start seeding Fiends episodes. Follow twitter.com slash fiendtorrents to grab the past episodes and new ones as they post. Leave your computer on seeding the torrents while you're at work or asleep. The more people seeding the Fiends, the more drone-proof we'll be when the boot comes down. That's twitter.com slash fiendtorrents. Corporate Avenger. What do you think? What do you think of that band? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, not my style. I'm not really into the whole dressing up and wearing chains kind of thing and painting your face, but uh, good message. I like the music. Says it's the guy funny. whose favorite rapper is Tech 9 My favorite rapper is not Tech 9 I like Tech 9 but he's definitely not my favorite rapper. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does paint his face and do that whole thing, but that's not... I mean, that's not what makes me like Tech Nine. I like his the way he can spit. He's fast, like a, a Tech Nine. Well, you know, they're not they're not dressed up like this in their other videos. Oh, they're not. Okay, okay. No. Yeah, it was it was good though. Um, <laughs> I don't cry when the police die because they probably deserved it. I mean, can't argue with that line, right? No comment. <laughs> I'm just listening to some some feisty rock music. Yes, exactly. Rock music. Yeah. It's very rockin'. Um. So, yeah. So speaking of art, I wanted to mention that Robert Roger Ebert tweeted one of my movies, sort of. Uh, I'll post a link to this. It's two years ago. I just found out about it. Um, he posted a tweet to the video I did about my for my daughter where I'm singing Hallelujah, uh, the Jeff Buckley uh, version yeah. of the uh, Leonard Cohen song, and yeah. uh, he was really moved by it and tweeted it. Yeah, well, it's very moving. Um, that's I think it's a it's a it's a very moving song. It moves a lot of people, and your video is, I mean, it's so obvious that you're that that you feel it completely heartfelt because it's about your experience with your daughter, isn't it? Yeah, it's right after she died of leukemia, and uh, yeah, I mean. And I posted on Top Lock, Cop Lock about this. You know, that was kind of part of how I became a a marijuana activist. Uh, you know, because yeah. she was smoking pot. She wasn't a pot smoker, and she smoked pot at the um, recommendation of a of a medical personnel. Uh, you know, a, 
not a prescription, a, you know, nod, nod, wink, wink, this will help right. you kind of thing. Right, right. And uh, the thought that someone could have thrown her in a cage just broke my brain, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Or fixed yeah. your brain. Fix my brain. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I mean, it's kind of a, a goal of filmmakers, you know, to to have Roger Ebert say something good about one of your movies. And he's probably never, probably doesn't even know my movies exist, but this little grainy YouTube video, he tweeted and said he really liked it and it was moving. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool beans. Yep. So moving right along, um, we talk about the, the Muslims, why Muslims should be libertarian and my repost of it. Why? <laughs> oh, where? Yeah. Well, um, I was Googling the whole title to see, you know, what where it had been bounced around at. Uh, the title, Why Muslims Should Be Libertarian, of course. Which I actually with. named that one. And I think I was inspired by Randy England's book, Why Catholics Should Become Libertarians. Right, right. Um, and so, we, yeah, we sort of came up with that as sort of a reference to that. But also because, you know, there's a big chunk of it where – uh, he's basically talking about how the current political system is no friend to anybody who is a Muslim at all. There's no place for them in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Um, so I took the next logical leap and said, well, you know, maybe they should be libertarian. Maybe they should uh, espouse the ideas of liberty. And that's sort of what Will does is help explain the ideals of liberty uh, through an Islamic filter for Muslims, um, both to encourage Muslims to become libertarian uh, or uh, espouse the ideas of freedom and also to combat uh, the crazies who think um, – Islamo fascism is taking over the world. And um there's actually a site called Libertarian Republican which um when I googled why Muslims should be libertarian it showed up. It was like near the top of the list. I didn't even have to scroll down for it. And I was like, "Hmm. What's this?" Um and I clicked on it and it was not at all what I would imagine being a site that would post uh this interview with Will Coley or anything from uh, a freedom fiend. Um I was like, whoa. I mean, my first impression was these guys are kind of ignorant bigots. Um, here's their description of their website. It's fiscally conservative, socially tolerant, libertarian, Republican, classical liberal, and then out of nowhere, anti-Islamo-fascist. And I'm like, how can you be socially tolerant and use the term Islam anti-Islamo-fascist or even Islamo-fascist. I feel like if you use the term Islamo-fascism unironically, you might be uh, a bigot. Uh, or you a might be a bigot if... <laughs> you might be a redneck, well, which is funny because Will Coley, the Muslim I interviewed, calls himself a redneck from Tennessee and is yeah. a good old all-American boy. Well, that uh, site... That site, Libertarian Republican, is run by Eric Dondero, who um, I've met. He's been in my home. He's had dinner here. Uh, he is connected with the RL, uh, Re Republican Liberty Caucus, RLC. And when I mm -hmm. first started getting in Liberty and was still a minarchist, I was involved with them. I was the Wyoming chair for the Republican Liberty Caucus, which I never did anything. I think we, you know, took, took our uh, – DJ and I took our – you know, we, we paid our dues, and since we had the dues, we were allowed to use them as we wished. So we took our dues and rented a table at a gun show and printed up some pamphlets and got some balloons at Party America and sat there and <laughs> hit, nobody talked to us. And, uh, you know, because everyone at, at a gun show in Casper is either probably a Constitution Party person or someone who doesn't like the word libertarian, a lot of them, or uh, not all of them, but, you know, a lot of them. Uh, or, you know, there are Democrats that just like guns that go there and the word Republican is dirty to them. So, mm -hmm. um, but I was involved with that. And like a year ago, I started telling uh, Dave Nail, who runs, who's a good guy otherwise, you know, yeah. but he, he runs, uh, he runs the RLC. And I told him, you know, I no longer want to be a part of this organization. I'm not, I'm not involved in the process. And uh, it was about nine months ago. I sent him the first email asking him to remove me from being listed as the Wyoming chair for the Republican Liberty Caucus on RLC.org. As of this morning, I'm still listed on there. And I've sent him, I've kind of upped my emails to him asking him to take it off. Uh, 
you know, uh, and he wrote me back on one of them. I written him like once a week for like five weeks now. And I, about three weeks ago, he said, yeah, oh, I thought I did this. I'll get on this. And, uh, he still hasn't done it. I wrote him again last night. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm going to blog at him. I'm going to do a blog okay. post called like okay. why I hate being considered part of the RLC, <laughs> which will not. Ah, he took me off. Never mind. He's a great guy. Go. I job. appreciate him. Everything's good. There's still a hundred other places on the internet where I wrote articles and said, you know, I'm a member, but, uh, I can't do anything about that at this point, but I it just was, don't it like, was in the past. I'm sure they have uh, dates yep, on them. So. Yep. So good. Good on you, Dave. Nail took me off. So, um, <laughs> but Finally. Eric Don Eric Dondero, that's how you you came to know him through the yeah. RLC? I think I think he's kind of the like <laughs> stepchild, like that they don't talk about. I don't know. <laughs> he used to work for Ron Paul and and got fired by Ron Paul. And there's actually there have been rumors. I don't believe them, but uh, there have been rumors that he's the guy that wrote the racist newsletters. But mm. there's no proof of that, and he's actually gone to great lengths to you know defend that there were those things in the newsletters and say it wasn't him and it wasn't other people. And uh, uh, I don't know, but um, yeah, well, the guy, he, he, the, the site, if, if you run, he if runs it, speaks it right? for itself. It is. He, he it, runs it it. it. it does speak for itself. Go check it out. I'm sure the fiends will all come to the pretty much the same conclusion. Um, you know, I, it, it libertarian was, was, Republican.net. I mean, okay. Is you that know, it? half, it, half when the, I went there, the, the are, first post, the first post was all like, OMG, a Cairo protester is wearing a Guy Fox mask. Oh my god, Muslim anarchists are going to take over the world. Ah. Well, he also and, runs something called um Libertarians for Mitt Romney. And oh my god. He's he's done this before. I mean, he had Libertarians for for um for who's the guy for the New York City mayor that ran for president? Um uh Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, he had Libertarians for Giuliani previously Ugh. um you know he's they, really they cease to be called libertarians at yeah i mean at I least mean, you, the you are just it, mutilating the term guy at least the rlc backs usually backs you know they don't usually back someone for president but if they have an article about uh i think in this election they are backing um uh who's the guy gary the litter johnson. bug the pot smoking litter bug yeah gary, gary johnson, johnson. <laughs> um yeah i mean but, but they're, they're the, the republican liberty caucus right. so at you least you don't the, expect them to be libertarian or anarchist. right at least you RLC. know i would expect the rlc to back gary johnson and you know they backed ron paul previously um mm -hmm. i don't know why they're not backing ron paul if they're the libertarian republicans and he was running as a republic he's running as a republican but uh no but but uh, Eric Dondero takes it one step further and backs 12 Romney. steps further and backs yeah, Romney because yeah, yeah. he wants to back a winner that. or something, man. Yeah. And, you know, part of there's an article here about why Romney's great because he's, uh, you know, anti, he, he's going to put those Muslim extremists in their place. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, for, for a sound refutation of that from uh, an American Muslim libertarian, check out the Will Coley interview. And uh, the only reason I came across this libertarian Republican site and Eric Dondero uh, was because apparently the RSS, your RSS feed automatically goes to them. Well, because uh, a long time ago, when I first joined the RLC, like three, three, yeah, three years ago, um, Eric Dondero found the right arm of Wyoming DVD CD and really liked the music uh, um, and added libertarian punk one of my blogs to his blog role so the title of all of right. my posts from okay. the RSS feed show up on the sidebar on his uh, on his blog and ah. um, he's just never <laughs> noticed I guess that I'm I'm not that way anymore and taking it off well you've never been bigoted towards Islam no and I never would have backed you know Romney, but uh, yeah. <laughs> even in my most status moments, right? But uh, yeah, but you know, even I, when you were a what Democrat, I did, <laughs> what I what I did was I reblogged your blog on the Anarchy Gumbo podcast on Libertarian Punk, which Libertarian Punk is almost a dead blog. Like I don't do much with it anymore. Um, I'm just too busy. And I'm keeping the site because I have a lot of things on there linked from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise I would just point the. Uh, the domain of the freedom fiends or something. But, um, you know, I, I barely do stuff on there anymore, but I actually reblogged your why Muslims should become libertarian on libertarian punk specifically and only. So it would show up on Eric Dondero's <laughs> site on the sidebar. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, anybody who clicks on it from that website will probably stop listening as soon as they hear Will Coley say the long pronunciation of, of Muhammad. It's <laughs> yeah, the thing afterwards where he we, says the whole thing. We actually had a comment on that, yeah. something about <laughs> Islamic throat clearing. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't call it that, but um, yeah, he had a phrase that he said every time after he said uh, Wasn't it Muhammad. God is great? No, it wasn't Allah Akbar. It was... I don't know what it was, but it was it was something like "peace be upon him" and a bunch of other stuff. And yeah, um, it was like a sentence. It was yeah, it was long. Yeah, um, but you know, if that guy's deal, fair enough. Um, it's a choice he made that doesn't affect me at all. So. Yeah, yeah. And one of the tags you used on this was Sharia, which I'm sure Eric Dondero uses as a tag on his blog, but in different probably ways. <laughs> yeah, in a scary way. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure someone will point out to Eric Dondero that this podcast exists this episode and this part of this episode and he'll probably take me off his blog you know he actually sent me a series of really racist emails one night um about you and about your he he liked the oh, guns really? and weed he liked the guns and weed movie he was and he said he was dr i was like are you drunk and he's like yeah and uh he he liked the guns and weed movie but he said you shouldn't have put all of that hip hop in there that's you know that's not american that's that's ghetto music and I was like, first of all, where, it's where are ghettos it's, from? They're from you know, America. For, first of all, it's you know, <laughs> well, there's ghettos everywhere, but uh, you know, America hip hop is ultimately an American music form, specifically yeah. and only yeah. originally. And you know, really, America's only had um, there's only three types of music that ex that America invented, and it's blues, jazz, and hip hop. And one yeah. could even argue. Um, blues was such a fusion with African music too that maybe not even blues could be considered specifically American. But jazz and hip hop are the only two real specifically American. Only Why do you not include originally? Rock? Oh, because rock. Um, because uh, England had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Because um, it really, it really. Uh, because it was invented because in the England. Beatles, the Beatles were no, the biggest yeah, influence. well, well, it really was a lot of it. I mean, you know, there was there was uh, who's the guy like like to poo on people? Um, guitar <laughs> player. Uh, did Johnny be good? You know, uh, uh, Johnny Rotten. Johnny, no. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. The guy uh, who liked to poo on people. Well, I should that's know the rumor. That. That's the rumor. <laughs> Uh, Chuck Berry. There's a rumor that he likes Chuck to, Berry like to poo on people. That's the rumor. That's the rumor. Mm. Man, that song you posted was was from Nicki Majka. Is that her name? Nick Nicki Minaj. Yeah, you said he pre he did a Mickey Minaj. He said he, he said he, that he, elephant. This dude's face got Nicki Minaged on. Yeah. Yeah, and I had to go like click on that link, and I was like, oh my god, that song is crude and uncouth, man. <laughs> I love it. It's that all about song. pooing on people you don't like. Yeah. Well, well, in hip hop, when you say I. Can I cuss? When, when, when no. You say, um, no. When you say I never, you know, we don't, we don't cuss. When you say I ested on somebody, you know, like I duked on somebody, I sh on somebody. Yeah, yeah. When you say that, that means like I outdid you. Like, but she I'm really did it. Yeah, she made I'm, it I'm that far above you. She took it literal, man. That song. Well, I. Uh, it, she she's really good at playing the line between. That's one of the reasons I think she's a great MC. She's really good at, at playing that line because you know it, it was kind of literal, but it it's kind of not. But I loved I loved her wordplay. I mean, in, in the chorus, not only does she say I I you know did it on him, but she also says put your number twos in the air if you did it. <laughs> <laughs> like throw it's a double entendre. You get it? Yeah. Um, Man, what's the song she does with Eminem? That's harsh too. It's great. It's a lot of haters. I don't know, man. I'm I'm not super up to date on my Nicki Minaj. Okay, well if you go to uh, if you go to Freedom Fiend's blog, you go to the Kitty, you go to Freedom Fiend's blog, and then uh, you look at Nima's post about the the Michael Jackson of India and the GOP, <laughs> and look at the elephant video, and then uh, which I was just amazed that there's a Michael Jackson in India. That guy was awesome. What's his name? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, Prabhu Deva. Um, I'm not yeah. sure if you if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, Google him or uh, Google Benny Lava. That's how I found out about him. It's it's this really hilarious and kind of crude series of videos where uh, this guy, I think he calls himself Buffalax. He takes um, <laughs> he takes Indian Bollywood uh, musical sequences, which are great. They're fun to watch. Like say what you will about India and Bollywood, but uh, 
it's colorful, it's musical, it's the dancing and choreography is awesome. He takes these these great Bollywood dance sequences and um he superimposes what he thinks they're they're saying, uh how it's how it would sound in English. Buffalo um, sounds like something you'd give to constipated bison before you film a is, video of them pulling a Nikki. But but yeah, <laughs> but when, when you're out YouTubing and looking up random stuff just for uh, just for number twos, uh, go ahead and check out Buffalo Axe. Check out Benny Lava. You'll get to see a hilarious uh, YouTube concept, and you'll get to see Prabhu Deva uh, doing his thing. He calls himself the Michael Jackson of India, but other people call him that too. So it's not just a self designation. And he's really good. He's he's like an amazing uh, dancer and does some amazing things. So uh, or just Google him. There's a playlist on YouTube watch it and, and i was watching it the other night and uh, i guess we could say the blog post because everybody's seen it and there's this scene in a really weird video with some really weird like uh video toaster animations and weird stuff and there's this bit where and it's kind of racist too because they're like in some native african village or the, there's like these native maybe it's india there's these native peoples and pravu deva convinces this this native guy to come over he touches an elephant the elephant turns red um and the the native guy picks up the elephant's tail and the elephant totally just craps on his face like out of nowhere like why did you feel the need to have this guy's face get crapped on i know um i found the Nicki image <laughs> how do you say your name minaj Nicki minaj featuring eminem roman's revenge Ro- roman's revenge it is a yep, yep. really harsh diss of uh haters ah uh excellent yeah she's she's a really great mc like when she first came out, I was like, "Man, she's gonna be the next big thing. She's awesome," and I don't know. She's kind of poppy now. Like, not everything she does is amazing. Um, she kind of got caught up in herself, but I still think she's a great MC, especially as far as female MCs go. I think her only rival would rival would be Lauren Hill, and I think she's probably a better lyricist than Lauren Hill. Yep. So uh, on that note, let's go sell some things. All right. Gun Training with the Non-Aggression Principle, Volume 1. Basic Handgun and Rifle with Jared Waltz. First rule of being alive is you own yourself. A groundbreaking approach to firearms and self-defense training. Beautifully filmed and easy to understand instructions make this one a must-have. Gun Training with the Non-Aggression Principle, Volume 1. New DVD from Michael W.D. Available on Amazon. Yo, Yo, Nima. What's up? So I want to start a proxy war of stalkers with Ben Stone. What is? Well, that guy called in last week and said he had a man crush on Ben Stone and he lived near him. And I said, well, you know, I have his address. <laughs> and Ben has Ben has my address, too, because I sent him something uh, once. Um, uh-huh, sent him some uh-huh. buttons. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could I could send stalkers over there and then he could send stalkers over here. It could be a proxy war of stalkers. That's like it, pod, pod beef deluxe. It's pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But I can't I can't imagine a good reason for wanting to go to any kind of war with Ben Stone. I know. I know. He's such a First of all, he's a pacifist. Second of all, he's a pacifist who'll beat you senseless. Yeah, I don't think he's a pacifist. I know. He has two <laughs> fond memories of Anyway, so Worms, man. He he he's he is a non aggressionist. Yeah. So yeah. um in Pink Floyd's movie The Wall and record the wall. The evil judge is named Worm. W U R M. Good morning, yeah. Worm, Your Honor. The crown will plainly show the prisoner who now stands before you was caught red handed showing feelings. feelings. And uh, Professor in Futurama's nemesis is Wormstrom. Wormstrom. Yeah, yeah. Although, refresh my memory, in, in the wall is the judge. Does he look like a worm? Does he look like some kind of monster? I don't remember. I remember, no, he I looks remember like not he looks human. He looks like he looks kind of human. He's uh, kind of human, obese okay. and wearing a wig, a white. Oh, he, lo- he wig. looks like an Englishman. Yeah, okay. yeah. He's not human. He's an Englishman. <laughs> He's an Englishman. <laughs> uh, that's bigoted. That's racist. Well, but um, okay. So yeah, so that that's two worm villains, and then in Friday uh, with Chris Tucker and Ice Cube. The, the villain who runs an ice cream truck is called Big Worm. <laughs> Big Daddy Worm. No, just Big Worm. So there, there's plenty of examples of worms in pop culture, not just us. Anarchists don't break windows. Keynesians break windows. That's what <laughs> Lou came up with, man. That was, I love that was, it. That's that that a, a line in his That blog. is total bumper that sticker was, material. I know. I thought so, too. 
I, I, I don't think he even recognized the brilliance of it because otherwise he would have named the blog post that at least. It was just a passing comment in it. It was it was a an Im, it was a, a title under an image. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yep. it's so perfect though. That yeah. That shit. I mean, that stuff there. I went through that whole segment trying to not say the S word, and then I just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um. But just, that right there. I'll just start just... finding you bitcoins. <laughs> we'll have a Bitcoin swear jar. That'd be a good name for an episode. Bitcoin swear Bitcoin jar. Bitcoin swear jar. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That might actually be better than what I had. Yes. But uh, good job, Lou. That's awesome. Um, anarchists don't break windows. Uh, Keynesians do. I'm going to have to send that one to my dad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need to find that picture for, uh, if I'm going to call this, I don't do art, I do propaganda. I need to find that picture of that graffiti that says, spread anarchy, and under it, in different paint, someone wrote, don't, don't tell, tell me, me what, what to do. To do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Good job. You're going to steal some time from the fiends in order Got to do it. that. Got yeah, it. Excellent. That was a quick theft. Yeah. Quick and easy. Yeah. We were comfortable while you did your thing. <laughs> Just sit back and be comfortable while I do my thing. What's that from? That's from The Simpsons. The uh, Simpsons. Disco Stew. Disco yeah. Stew, man. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, what else you got, man? What else you got? How, how do we get from there to uh, to the Israel's radical left? Well, let's save that for the, the Freedom Fix at the end. Um, interesting Agorists' uh, oppose, opposition to voting differs from views of Murray Rothbard, who defended the act of voting. That's what Wikipedia says. Now, did Murray Rothbard ever defend the act of voting? It wouldn't surprise me. I know he did waffle. I don't know if waffle's the word. Um, but he did engage in various amounts of cooperating with the state not with the state, but within the political system. I mean, he's one of the co-founders of uh, the Cato Institute, right? Which uh, Ben Stone calls him out on and says, you know, that was Murray's, that was one of his big mistakes, was thinking that we could work within the system. Um, I think I think Rothbard noticed his mistake, and that's one of the reasons he tried to pull out. And then there was a whole bunch of infighting a few months ago uh, that had to do with... Um, with maybe Murray's share of it, something like that. I don't really remember it, but I know that that Murray did have some ties with trying to get people to work within the system, at least as one strategy. Well, his he also had another criticism of agorism was that um, he believed it was impossible, implausible that the black market could outcompete the white market, providing large goods like automobiles, steel, and cement because uh, they're less valuable and harder to conceal than things like jewels, gold, drug, drug, ghoul, <laughs> ghouls, jewels, gold, and drugs, which are perfect for uh, the black market because they're easy to conceal. Um, he has, I kind of has, yeah, kind of has a good point. I mean, yeah. you know, if you wanted to set up an agorist cement business and you built a giant factory and said, "I'm not paying taxes," and I'm only gonna, you know, you'd be closed down in a month, a week, a day. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of a bummer. I mean, it is the fact that the state does have their hands in things. And sometimes we want to pretend that the state can't have power over us. But like you said earlier in the cast, you got to be realist on some things and, and pick your battles. Uh, you couldn't start an, uh, an agorist cement company or an agorist car company. I mean, you you might could build your own car and sell it to your friends or, or two or three, but uh, you're not going to be able to build a factory and ship them and have ports accept them or anything like that. Although one, th um, Rothbard did say that he liked the, that Konkin wrote the treatise on agorism because he felt that um, alternate ideas are good. And I agree. It's kind of like it's how you make lib pair. You have to throw a bunch of ideas out and discuss them and argue them and try them out. Oh, and and I'm not completely. saying I'm not saying that I agree with him that agorism is is a lost cause. But uh, you know, I'm person. I'm not an agorist. Uh, a lot of my friends are. I just think it's interesting to point out that Murray Rothbard uh, was highly critical of it because a lot of people don't know that. Even some people who are agorists who probably quote Rothbard. Well, I don't know. I guess you have to define terms because when I think of agorism, I just think of I think of pure market. And I know now it's it's got this connotation of people trying to do things without the compliance of the state, but I consider that pure market. Um I think 
if the state ceased to exist, what you would have, I would, I could define as agorism because the state wouldn't be involved. Um, the state prevents, you know, the types of agorism that, that we want to see and that we hope to see in Lidpair. And that's one of the reasons we, we long for the passing of the state. Yes. But I think you're right that, you know, it's important to point out that, um, that not everything somebody like Rothbard says is 100% right. And not everything anybody there says you in Liberty Media is 100% right. Um, and Ben Stone is fond of pointing out that, that if you do believe somebody has some kind of um, perfectness about their message, um, then you, you better check yourself because, you know, you might be engaging in a little bit of, of great manism. You might be deifying somebody or somebody's ideas. Um, but there's so many of us out there throwing out what we feel, what, what our ideas are, uh, people logicking things out. Um, I think the, the wheat get, will get separated from the chaff, or I guess that's not a good term for anarchists since they're all paleo, but, um, the cream will <laughs> rise to the top. That's not paleo either. Oh, <laughs> um, the meat will, the good cuts of meat will be pulled away yes, from the yes. bad cuts of meat. Yes. The delicious char will be um, deglazed from the bottom of the cast iron pan <laughs> with a delicious. You know, if you're red uh, wine. if you're truly paleo, you don't drink beer. You you can drink red wine though. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you couldn't drink like gin either because it's made from grain. So yeah. there was a really low voter turnout in the primaries in Wyoming. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope there's a really low voter turnout in this upcoming presidential election. Hey, did oh, we ever talk about bread and circus in Greece and Rome and the ratings war back then on here? Uh, on the phone. I don't know if we record. I don't think we recorded okay. it. Well, um, I was watching this documentary on History Channel about how, uh, you know, and another reason I like the 9-11 uh, documentaries that keep coming out is, you know, I used to call the History Channel the Hitler Channel. Because everything on there is about Hitler. And I think they've made the 1,000 or 2,000 documentaries about Hitler, and they've run out of stuff. So now they're making the nine, it's the 9-11 <laughs> channel. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Which I'm is, glad you know, I don't have TV. Which is, I'm so glad. So which glad. is the bitter bread and circus of now. Bread and circus was a term from back in the day. Yeah. Uh, can you explain it? Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> f f I guess. From what I understand, um is the term used for uh, in ancient Roman civilization? Um, it's kind of like the role that TV plays now. They entertained people. They kept them fed with bread, and uh, they had the circus, what, what, which was also the Colosseum and gladiator events. Uh, I'm no historian, but from what I understand, uh, it was very important for uh, the upper echelons of Roman society to keep the peons uh, pacified and, of course, feeding them with cheap food like bread made from grains and, of course, uh, letting them go to these events uh, went a long way to keep people's minds off of but basically the real it kept situation. them from revolting. I mean, yeah. the the better the Colosseum, they kept, they kept them happy, and the more frequent you had wonderful, horrible things in it, uh, you know, people being killed or plays or whatever. You know, the more the more you did things like that as a as a tyrant, the more pacified your uh, subjects right. would be. So, which, which is really a line of, of authoritarian thought that didn't end there and I think has been espoused a lot. I mean, that's basically what Brave New World was about. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's it entertainment about, to entertain yeah. them and to you know, give them drugs and, and video screens until they right. just shut up. Right. And, the future uh, of it was, was Soma and orgies instead of yeah, Red and Circus. Yeah. Yep. And uh, – the 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 states that did the best were the like Rome had a great Colosseum and, and the emperor you know spared no expense of stolen money to uh to keep great things happening all the time in the Colosseum so he had a higher market share and you were talking about in modern <laughs> terms of like you know what would he have like a, what's like New York City have say like a thousand well the way the way we always ranked our market was was by rank uh, against all other markets so New York would be one. Uh, in, uh, in, in the so TV Rome, terms that Rome had a one TV so Rome, rating. Rome would be one. Yeah, yeah. market one. DMA one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's and, kind of. And, but, but but Rome wasn't the only Colosseum. I mean, you go see the ruins in Rome. Yeah, that's a giant Colosseum. But I mean, there were more it, all all throughout the empire. Yeah, and you know, smaller ones that weren't as cool in places you haven't heard of. Yeah, yeah. You know, like Which the, Ar- the Arkansas. I mean, you know, the Fayetteville, Arkansas of the ancient world. <laughs> with market yeah, share yeah. of like, like eight hundred. The, Ca- the Casper, Wyoming. So <laughs> yeah. What's the, the share empire? here? What's the share? Uh, what was Wyoming? It was one. I think it was one ninety seven when I was there. It was really yeah. low, but not. Uh, I don't think there's anything that hits three hundred low. I think the the lowest is probably two fifty. They don't even count you after that. Which is weird because there are more than 250 places in America where there is TV, you know, local TV produced. Um, I think they rank them down to the lowest one. Huh. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's only ones that carry ABC, NBC affiliates. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. It has to be network affiliates. Uh, okay. I don't think okay. public access or anything like that counts. <laughs> Which is interesting because if there were public access show or channel that got more popular than the 250 ranked in their system, they probably would would not include them. Yeah. Well, plus the way they do markets, it's almost kind of gerrymandered. Um, you know, they they lump things in. Like for instance, uh, Cheyenne. I I'm, I think Cheyenne is is in the same market as Denver. It's either in the same market as Denver and the same wow. market as Casper. So they'll they'll be little towns that have little stations. Like Cheyenne has its own, I think, ABC affiliate, uh, unless it's changed since I've left. Um, but they don't count as their own market. They they either fall under Denver, which they have no hopes of ever competing with, or Casper, which they actually do compete pretty well with at the Wyoming Broad- Association of Broadcasters Awards. Yeah. Yep. But, so yeah, we saw a movie. Speaking of bread and circus, we saw a movie. We did speaking of bread and circus. Although I don't think Vice counts as that because <laughs> I, I feel like they're more about uh, the changing. Well, yeah. you know, people they're more about riling you up than pacifying you. People who've complained about the system way before libertarians or people who weren't libertarians. One of the things they've always complained about is the lies of the mainstream media. And yeah. the om- lies by omission of the mainstream media. I mean, look at the movie Network from 1972, mm-hmm. maybe. You know, I mean, it's it it lays it all out there. I mean, it it even says, like, you know, they're owned by foreign banks in Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, it's like the Alex Jones of 1972 or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, taking digs at uh, mainstream media is nothing new. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, I don't know if it's an actual quote because it's hard to tell with those uh "Quote unquote founding fathers" quotes, but didn't he say something to the effect of um, a man who reads nothing at all is smarter than a man who reads nothing but newspapers? <laughs> who said that? I, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson, but again, That's disclaimer funny. for founding fathers because it's hard to tell if they really said these kinds of things. <laughs> but I believe I, I remember hearing him quoted as that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the people, the movie we're talking about is called um, Israel's Radical Left. A documentary from Vice magazine, and yeah, even there, um, the people are complaining. The the interviews she does, the the people are complaining about their media, their Israeli media, uh, not not really taking on uh, the positions of the people, but the positions of the powered people, just like they do here, just like the Fourth Estate has done pretty much since since its existence. Fourth Estate being the media, which is ridiculous. Yeah. What are the first three estates? The people, the government, and the church. No, I don't even think the – well, I guess the people are included, but I don't think the commoners. Yeah, I thought it was the the state, the church, the bourgeois, I think, which is the middle class and the media. But I'm not sure. It's the, the estates of the realm of the Middle Ages. Cleric, ah. knight, cleric knight, and workman. Oh, that was in the Middle Ages, but uh, I think there was a usage later. I look, look up the French stuff. I think the French invented this whole estate thing. Fourth, fourth estate. estate. The fourth estate, journalism. States reference to no, it was cleric, knight, and workman. So it was the church, the church, the military, the, the military, and the people. I guess, yeah, I guess the, the commoners. People. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Hmm. Well, well there you the go. knight, no, the knight is stands for the um, not the army, but the nobility, nobility. Okay. Yeah, so it's 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 the church, the state, and the people. And then that's weird that the. <laughs> the uh, the press would be the fourth estate because really shouldn't it be 
of the people. I mean, that's how they present themselves. <sighs> that's well, they kind of don't. That's how they sell themselves. They pre- they really yeah. present themselves as of the state, I think. And in Wyoming, I, I think the do. church in Wyoming. but <laughs> And the church in Wyoming. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, yeah. let's talk about this. Uh, we got a couple minutes here left. Let's talk about this wonderful documentary we saw. What's it called? Okay. From Vice Magazine. From my, Vice Magazine, Israel's Radical Left. And I'm not going to link kind this. Of a misnomer. Yeah, I'm going like, to. You're going to have to go. You're going to have to go to the the Fiend's blog to find it. It's on there. I okay. Reviewed, I reviewed yeah, it. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll entice you. We'll give you incentive to go to the Fiend's blog, which you should anyway because it's awesome. I mean, yeah. It it's a it's a great way to um to ingest fiends and not have to do it through your ears. Sometimes you want to ingest. <sighs> which is good if you're at eyes. work and stealing time from your boss and you can't exactly. listen to audio content. And you know, exactly. I'll, I, you can always use the the control cap lock or the control tab. Control yeah. tab on a PC goes from one window to another. So you can go from yeah. the fiends blog to the spreadsheet you're supposed to be working on. Yeah. yeah. The spreadsheet of of uh people people that are dangerous to the state that you're that you're cataloging <laughs> for the central scrutinizer. Yeah. All right, so we saw this movie. We liked it. We did. We did. Um, don't let the the radical left uh, in the name throw you off. Although it's wrong. It, it, it doesn't. They really are take, in there. But. There is. There is. It, it doesn't really take too much of a a position left or right or statist or or non statist. It's more just about um, the people in Israel and how different they are. And from in the Palestine, I mean, they showed Palestinian and in Palestine. anarchists in the same light that they showed the Israeli leftists. Yeah, the, yeah, they did. Uh, and, and my first impression, wa- wa- my first impression watching it was, it's a lot ballsier to to be a protester in Israel, I think, than it is to be a protester here. Um, it, it seems like much more of a war zone, especially for some of the people that uh, that they follow. Um, well, they also they've had like military, they've had so- armed soldiers working as police on the streets for far longer than and everywhere. We're just starting to get that, but right, you know, right. I mean, they've had in Israel a soldier will walk up to you on the street and check your bags, and it's always been yeah. like that. Right, right. Well, I mean, there's a guy. There's one guy that um, he seems super brave, and they they feature him near the the beginning in the first segment. The guy who dresses up as a soldier, painted white, and carries no, not a that fake one. Gun. The, the one that actually protests with the Palestinians. Ah, uh, yeah. Like he drives the other side of the wall. And protests the wall with the Palestinians. While while um, the while the Israelis are shooting flares at them and tear gas. yeah yeah. Although the there's and little boys bullets. throwing rocks at them first. So I I guess you don't know who's first, but um, the camera shows the editing shows little boys throwing rocks at the 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 wall. Um, well, that's course, kind of the problem with the an ongoing war of aggression where both sides claim self defense in anywhere yeah. in history. Right, is it's a cycle of violence. You know, I guess unless somebody's going to, I mean, really, is it if you if you're going to go to like preemptive things or self defense? I mean, if if a if a citizen took that path, you know, that would mean you could go kill anybody you think might kill you someday, which uh, wouldn't jive. But apparently, states can do it, and you know. If if uh you know if somebody kills you and then leaves your house or, you know if someone kills your family member and then leaves the house and you go hunt them down you know that's not self defense um but it kind of gets down to like unless somebody at some point turns the other cheek you know you can always say well I'm retaliating for what they mm-hmm. just did and it's like right. where does it go back to I mean I guess it goes back to Abraham had two sons but you know more more recently it goes back to Palestinian land being stolen by Israel yeah but yeah you're right it's hard because it almost becomes an infinite pattern of regression and, <laughs> and then it's hard really and, and, and it's like it's how 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 do you how are you expected to turn the other cheek when your land is gone you know and you're hurt, hurtled into like you know, Indian reservation type stuff. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Well, uh, this guy that was siding with the the Palestinians, he was an Israeli, uh, you know, physically side by side with them, not just, you know, uh, oh, well, I think they have uh, something to say here, but he was like literally there with them, getting tear gassed, uh, getting uh, rubber coated bullets shot at him. Not not rubber bullets, but steel slugs with a rubber coating shot at them, because I guess they do it big in Israel. Um, and the journalist asks him, you know, why is he willing to do that and get shot out? And she says, why are you willing to get shot at by your own people? Um, she, of course, means the Israelis because he's Israeli. And he goes, uh, those aren't my people. 
I'm fighting against them. The racists, the fascists, the supremacists. He makes that that oh so important distinction. Um, you know, he's saying the state goons in my land are not my people, even though they're from the same place. And it's 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 an easy distinction to make, uh, and I think anarchists do it all the time, and it's it's very good. But I think a lot of people in the mainstream don't make that distinction. They do think that okay, well, he is a traitor. You look at the comments on this vice thing, and they're, they're they call him a traitor to his people. But those aren't his people because he's not a state goon, and so he doesn't identify with them. And I think that's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it kind of—I um, <clears throat> think this is a good movie for people to watch in America. For the same reason, I think that Heavy Metal in Baghdad is a good re- movie for people to watch in America. Right. It, it kind of shows people is, it. you know, it's not the, the people aren't the state. You know, when you when exactly. you hate a state, you shouldn't hate all the people. Or the, right. the people, right. Um, right? Iraq isn't a, isn't uh, millions of Saddam Hussein's walking around. Yeah. Iran isn't millions of Ahmadinejad's walking around, and Israel isn't a million millions of Netanyahu's walking around either. You know, it's interesting. Right now, the Red Hot Chili Peppers are taking a lot of flack because they're going to go play Israel. I don't see the problem with that. I think they're playing for the people of Israel. They're, they're playing, not playing for, the, for the state. I would hope you know? they're playing for the people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine them playing for the state. I don't know. I guess they did kind of shill for Obama, though, didn't they? Yeah. They or at did. least at least the singer did. did. Yeah. 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 Anthony Crocus, as he's called by uh, Beavis and Butthead. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, watch this movie. It's a really... Uh, I, I really hate how so many Americans are so adamantly pro-Israel and so adamantly anti-Palestine without knowing anything about it. Nothing and you, about you really won't Nothing. know that much more about it after watching this other than, I mean, you will know that it's what it's like to live there a little more. And little uh, more. Yeah. something really horrible happens in this that I'm not going to give as a spoiler, I guess, but it made me cry. I mean, uh, not much makes me cry, but I cried watching this movie. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I I was gonna say it, but I won't say it either since you're not. But um, yeah, protest here end with weaponized hot sauce. But the big yeah. protest that they show ends with something much more gruesome than that. Yeah, I mean um, they don't show it, but it happens no. off camera while you're watching and you see people's yeah. reaction. Um, yeah, you see the reporter's reaction, yeah. which was probably the most genuine reporter reaction I think I've seen. Um, yeah, she literally gags. And I I tend I tend to you know. I don't like to have to pick a pick a pony in any fight, but I guess I lean a little more towards Palestine than Israel in that whole thing. But uh, this really if shows. If anything, it's because Palestine doesn't have a government. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you're root go. for whoever there whoever's you not a state. That would be for the go. Palestinian people. But uh, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people in this too from Israel that are like complaining about you know not having entitlements. But it comes down to basically like they trusted the state to provide them too. They did. You know? Yeah, yeah, and but there is some there is some of that, and you have to sort of. I kind of overlooked that. I kind of overlooked that. I just looked too. at the human drama and struggle, right, of all sides that are shown really neutrally in this film, right, right. And, and back to the point you made about seeing that people are just people. Um, there's a good segment on on the way that goes on, even in Israel and in Iran, uh, vis a vis the the Israel loves Iran Facebook page and the Iran loves Israel yeah. Facebook page. Uh, yeah. When when Netanyahu and the War Party in Israel started banging their fists for war, uh, regular Joes in Israel, uh, one in specific, started a page saying, "Hey." I got nothing against the people. I, I'm going to make a page called Israel Loves Iran and show how much we don't want to go to war. We don't want to fight these old statists' war. And Iran returned the same in kind and started their own page. And Iranians are saying the same thing. We don't want to fight these old imams' war. There's no reason for it. And in both countries, you have to. They both have uh, conscription. They both have conscription. Service. Yeah, yeah. Conscription. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the, uh, the takeaway here is that Vice Magazine is going to replace National Geographic. As, <laughs> seriously, I mean, they're they're making stuff that's really important. Unlike the same equipment I have in my house. I mean, really, yeah. they're they're using like little cameras and little microphones and little computers and and reaching the world. And uh, you all can too if you really have a good idea and do it right. Yeah. All right, man. Wormstrom. Wormstrom. <laughs> Wormstrom. All right. Good cast today, homie. Thanks. Peace. Hello, freedom fiends. It's your boy me from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my blood screen. I owe me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, one fact that I got.
The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.